Hello and welcome to the final installment of this season of A Closer Look with Mark Shine and Mark Miller. Hard to believe. 27 uh, or 28 20, shows? Yeah, something like that. Being way back in August. How about that? Yeah. All right. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, first of all, we're going to update and preview the tournament brackets that are coming up this week and weekend starting tonight. Mark's got division. Yeah, one. let's go to D1 right away. Let's take the brackets where Lima Senior and Finley have been competing in this. Lima Senior defeated Springfield 61-54. Jaleel King had 12, six players between five and nine points. The Spartans led by eight at half. Stretched it out to 16 in the third quarter. Brutal basketball game, nearly 50 fouls called. Three technical fouls. Spartans move on. Finley, they get a win over Waite, 51-34. Gooding, Nunn, and Roth with 14, 14, and 12. Then they lost to Anthony Wayne, who the Spartans will play next. Anthony Wayne, you go, okay, they've got seven losses. Yeah, but who are they to? Northview twice, Southview twice. A five-point loss to Wasion. That team's undefeated right now. An overtime loss to Toledo Christian. And in the very first game of the year, Lima Senior defeated Anthony Wayne 64-63 in overtime. Good game for the Spartans coming up, and that will be on Wednesday night against Anthony Wayne. Let's take a look at Division II over at Ohio Northern University. This is a WBL plus Napoleon and Wasion, and you can see there Defiance and Shawnee going to play each other. Two very close games. Defiance throws in a three at the buzzer to beat number two seed Elida. And Shawnee had to go to overtime to get Wapak. So they are both coming off dramatic wins. And in the bottom part of that bracket, uh, Van Wert was able to get by Kenton. So they get the, the pleasure of playing Wasion, the undefeated number one ranked team in the state of Ohio in Division II, also the number one seed here. Uh, Wasion gave up 19 to Salina including more turnovers than my sheet had room for. <laughs> uh, so you have to figure that Wasion's a favorite, but hey, you never know. You never One know. One thing for sure, we know Van Wert will play him tough. Yeah, I've talked to people about that. Van Wert's going to compete with them. Yeah. That, that might well be a Wasion victory, but look for a close game and a very competitive game. Let's move on to the D3 down at Lima Senior. Uh, the uh, first part of that we see on the board here, this is the Miller City part of this. This is Ottawa Glendorf. They defeated Spencerville 89-42. Spencerville had as many turnovers as they had points. Uh, 21 steals by OG in that, and their two point guards or two backcourt mates, Owen Hegel and Bryce Schrader, didn't play due to injury. Hope to get at least uh, Hegel back this week and maybe Schrader back the week after that. Then you see at the bottom of this, Paulding came out with wins over Bluffton and number two seed Tenora. So we have OG and Paulding in one half of that. The other half of the bracket, the half is played at Elida. Fort Recovery is on a roll right now. Peyton Judy with 38, 28 as they defeated Liberty Benton and then 18 more against Van Buren. They've made a lot of threes in those two basketball games. They will play Coldwater. They, they defeated Coldwater 54-51 back on February 9th. Judy had 22 that night. Albers had 12. Bruns had 12. That'll be another good matchup. And then the finals, of course, they'll match up with either Ottawa Glendorf or Paulding. Division 4 over to Elida. Mark Schein will be there to bring it to you. Yep. A couple of rematches from the regular season. Uh, Crestview and Ottoville, that is one of Crestview's losses. And we got to see those two teams last weekend. They're playing pretty well right now. That should be a really good game. Hard to beat a team twice, as we all know. And the other side of that bracket, Wayne Trace and Hicksville, the Aces. And that was a regular season matchup as well. So these should be two really good games that you get to broadcast tonight. The winners go to Bowling Green. Wayne Trace and Hicksville both out of the same conference. Of course, we saw that OG Ottaville game the other night. The way Ottaville shot the basketball, uh, Crusher had to really play some defense against those guys. Let's move on to the D4 Liberty Benton District. And let's see which bracket we have up here first. This is the PG side of it playing at Van Buren. They will play Miller City. Miller City defeated Corey Rossum by 33. Gable, uh, Otto, and Kuhlman all in double figures. Jared Brees had 17 in the win for Pandora Gilboa. PG has, has a close games this year with Miller City. It was a 44-42 game back on January 6th. They've also defeated the other half of the bracket as we put that up. They defeated Kaleida and Columbus Grove as well. You can see uh, Kaleida up in there a second ago. They had defeated Patrick Henry 47-37. Columbus Grove, the team we talked about coming on as a tournament came about, they have a win over Arcadia by 71-36 uh, and over North Baltimore in kind of an upset. Tate Burnester, the freshman, 21 the first game, 18 in the second. Blake Reynolds is playing well. They've made 12 three-point field goals in those two games. Collided defeated Grove, 58-49 back on the 20th of January. So a matchup of PCL foes right there. Still in Division Four tonight down at Wapak. It's a bunch of MAC teams. What a shocker there, huh? 
Marion <laughs> Local, the number one seed in New Bremen. This will not be a number, a typical number one versus number six seed. This uh, looks to be a really good game. Of course, Marion Local really caught their stride and had a great season, but especially at the end of the season when their uh, schedule got very tough, they rise to the occasion and won those games, got away with the league championship. On the other side of the bracket, it's another MAC rematch, Minster and St. Henry. And you know one thing about these MAC teams, if the good players are playing good when it really counts, Mark Shine and I get to do that final on Friday night, and the winner of this one goes to Kettering. All right, let's move on and take a look at what's going on down south since we talked about what's going on just a moment ago with the Kettering area. These are the teams that are in Division Three and are still competing down there. And, of course, for sales, the number one team in this particular bracket. Uh, as so often happens down in the southwestern part, Versailles has wins by 33, 43, and 24 in their tournament games so far. You can see they're on a roll. We keep going through the brackets. Anne is having a good tournament as well. They've won their basketball games by 13, 52, and 13. They will play Cincinnati Marion Purcell on Tuesday night, the 6th. And then let's look at what's going on in Division IV. A couple teams out of the SCAL are on a roll. Rushi's won their games by 26 and 16. Fort Laramie's won theirs by 44, 27, and 23. So matchups of those two teams in the finals, perhaps, and we can see things roll along throughout the tournament area in the Northwest and now in the Southwest brackets. That's right. Good luck to all our area teams, of course, with head-to-head -head battles. We're going to lose a lot of them this week, but we're at that point in the tournament. So good luck. Well, Mark, yep. uh, you've got a list of proposed basketball rule changes right. that M N FHS puts right. out in Ohio. The OHSA kind of follows their lead. So let's uh, go down through and talk about some of the interesting. All right, let's take a look at some of them. This came out because uh, the National Federation puts out a survey every year to coaches, to, to administrators, to officials. What changes would you like to see? And these are some of the proposals that came out. One of them, a little bit bizarre, I think. Should you get five team fouls per quarter instead of six per half? before you get into the one-on-one -on -one situations and then eliminate the one-on-ones and just go to two shots. So in other words, you get to five fouls, it's double bonus right away. Okay. <laughs> Should it be a technical foul to slap the backboard? We talked about that uh -huh. last week. Yeah. Should we play two halves instead of four quarters? Do like we really college. need a, yeah, like yeah. college, do we really need an extra break between first quarter and second quarter? Would there be more of a flow? The three-foot circle for block charge, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people like it. I don't as an official because it gives you one more thing to look at. You look at two, two players up here, then you've got to figure out where their feet are as well. I know it's a good idea in some situations. It's not a big one for me. Mm -hmm. um, there are ten different proposals involving <laughs> uniforms. <laughs> and I can tell you officials are tired of being uniform police. It's yeah. all kinds of stuff. The interesting one out of all that, should we allow the home team to wear dark and the away team to wear white? Because in football, we do that because the darker colors make you look bigger, right? I don't know. We always wore white at home when I was in high school football and basketball. Well, so it ebbs and flows from year to year. You know, if the kids would just wear the uniforms the way they're designed, yeah. we wouldn't have all these rules. <laughs> all right. Suppose you burned all your timeouts. you got bench players over there you want to get in the game. Can you call a timeout merely to substitute? Make it a 30. Get them on the floor as quick as we can. Of course, the shot clock idea at 35 seconds or 30, that's being proposed. You know, I'm against that, shot clock. That's a never-ending yeah. discussion there. Well, yeah. well, we'll see where that goes. That's a lot of expense, and I'm not sure it's necessary. We'll see where that goes. Should there be a signal if the ball gets tipped out of bounds? Well, I think most officials do that anyway. Yeah. Should This is one that you like, right? Oh, I like this one. Should a coach be allowed to call timeout anytime or only when there's a dead ball? And I will remind you, a dead ball situation occurs. If I score, the ball's laying out of bounds. That's considered to be a dead ball. Mm. Coaches only call a timeout during no. dead balls. I like that because it doesn't interrupt the flow of the play. It doesn't uh, bail a kid out when he's in trouble. It lets the kids determine and not the coach yep. way down the court calling a timeout and stopping play. Yeah, a, a player would have to call a timeout if the ball's actually live and going on. And I know that it's the way we used to do it. Coach would yell at a kid, call mm -hmm. timeout. Okay, mm -hmm. and this would take that out of the coach's hands. That's kind of an interesting one. Another proposal is to eliminate jump balls altogether. The visiting team would get the basketball first, and we would just go all running possession throughout the game. Right now, we also have a jump ball for overtime situations. What we would do is at the end of regulation time, whoever's possession row would get it would get to start yeah. overtime. Yeah. Eliminate jump balls. We started not having jump balls, first of all, because officials couldn't throw the ball eight foot up and straight in the air. <laughs> Well, that's, that's that is why, true. That's why it started, and, and we got away from that. Of course, the game flows a little bit better when you don't have all the held ball situations and going to jump balls anyway. One of them is currently everybody gets five timeouts. 
We have two of them are for 30 seconds and uh, three of them for 60 seconds long. You still get five timeouts. You can have three of them to be 60 seconds, but you can have as many as you want of those five be 30 second timeouts. So in other words, I burned both of my 30s. I only want to use a 30 second timeout. I can still use a 30 minute instead of making a full timeout. In reality, 30s morph into 60s anyway. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No <laughs> they're all about the same anyway. All right. Um, should you be allowed to time the timeout on your scoreboard? Oh, please, please don't do that. Don't. That's, those, that's hard on announcers and, and game personnel because really we're is. trying to figure out how much time is left in the quarter so that we can talk about strategy. And we look up in there and it says 35, 34, <laughs> yeah. 33. We right. don't care how much time's left in the timeout. We want to know how much time's left in the game. Exactly. And I know coaches feel the same way. At least many of them do the same way. We look up the scoreboard. How much time have we got left in this quarter? Oh, we're timing down the timeout. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it's a good idea to eliminate that. Too. And, and then finally, this one, and I would expand on this one, the proposal was. If the ball gets tipped out of bounds in the, in the uh, backcourt, you know, you got 10 seconds to get over the 10 second line. If the ball gets tipped out of bounds and rolls out of bounds, you get whatever time is left on the 10 second clock to get the ball over midcourt. Right now, you tip it out of bounds, you get a full 10 seconds. Yeah. Okay, now let's say your officials are counted at six, the ball gets tipped out of bounds, you get four seconds to get over mm -hmm. midcourt. Yeah. I, I know you've said that for yeah, years, and I, I agree with it. I think that's a great rule. And go ahead and expand it, because well, you've got I a better would, idea. If any th reason the clock stops, the coach calls timeout, whatever it might be, if that clock stops, you've got the amount of time you've got left on a 10-second count to get the ball over midcourt. That rewards the team for playing right. good defense. Right now, you're at nine. Timeout, you still get another 10 mm -hmm. to get over midcourt. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would reward the team for playing good defense and make that any time. We just I go agree. right from there. I agree. We There's reward the offense way too much. We there don't you reward go. the defense. Proposed rule changes. We'll see if any of them take place, but there you go. All right. Thanks, Mark Schein. Hey, it's time for our bright spots, and we've got several this week as we finish up this season. I get to start with Justin Arns, a great player from Versailles. You know, we, we give milestones when players hit 1,000 points. Justin hit 2,000. He <laughs> just got his 2,000th point. Yep. Uh, this was on February 27. They beat Milton Union 66-23, but he had 21 points. Congratulations to Justin 2,000 career points at Versailles. All right, we asked Nick and Ben to put on the screen for us all of the conference players of the year and coaches of the year from the different conferences that we have looked at. So let's kind of go through these very quickly. In the uh, Northwest Conference, we have Javen Etzler, the junior, 6'7", over at Crestview. And of course, his coach, Jeremy Best, won that thing as well. And as coach of the year, and in uh, 2014 was the last time they won the title. They started four juniors. They might well be there again next yeah, year. Yeah, he does everything for them. Here's the NWCC and a, uh, Brody Bowman, the scoring machine from Temple. Uh, he got player of the year, very well deserved. Coach of the year, Bill Clem from Elgin. Of course, they tied USV for the league championship. All right, and here's Justin Arns. We mentioned him just a moment ago. And Kurt Guttermiller from Marion Local. And of course, the uh, Marion Local Flyers won the championship in that conference. And there's uh, PCL and BBC. They combined them because both guys won it in both leagues. Player and coach, both from Pandora, Gilboa, Drew Johnson, the player, Coach Joe Bradick at PG. How, how do you win two conferences and go undefeated in both of them? How about That's that? Here's heck of the year. Western Buckeye League, Jay Kaufman. And he was player of the year last year as well. Came back from that knee injury. And then Tyson McLaughlin, his coach, got coach of the year at WBL, going undefeated in that conference. Here's the local players, Mark, yep. from the track. Yeah, a couple of first teamers, one each from Finley and Lima Senior. We've seen both those guys and second teamers, again, one each from Finley and Lima Senior. Really good players on yeah. both those teams. Yeah, Toledo, uh, St. John Swept, the Coach of the Year Player of the Year in that conference. All right, let's move on now. The next bright spot we want to talk about is Jay Kaufman. He uh, scored 27 points against Spencerville, and that put Jay over 1,000. So he's, he's halfway to what Arns did, <laughs> but he had a couple of knee injuries in between there. And what a great job of coming back to get Player of the Year, as you mentioned, yep. again, two years ago. And in his conference. Let's move on to a, one of his classmates, and that would be Katie Hempfling. She is now the career scorer leader at Ottawa Glendorf. She had, in a 55-40 win over Crestview, she had 25 points. That gives her 1,208 points in her career at Ottawa Glendar. She passes Melanie Hawker by four points. By the way, she also had seven rebounds, seven steals, five assists, and two blocks. That's a pretty good That's day. That's a pretty good day. That's a pretty and, good day. And kudos to both those teams, Crestview and OG, because during the national anthem, all the players, all the coaches, all the bat girl, or ball girls and everybody stood with their hand on their heart at, uh, during the national anthem. We appreciate that. Hey, let's take a look at a college guy, and he's not local but just such a really cool story that we wanted to bring it up. Maybe you heard about it. A sophomore guard from Iowa named Jordan Bohannon had a chance to break the consecutive free throw record at Iowa. 
and he had told a couple of teammates prior that he wanted to do this, and he actually pulled it off. He stepped to the line with a chance to make his 35th in a row, and he missed it, as it turns out, on purpose. Because he came back later in the game and hit two more, all, all net, and the reason he missed it is a guy named Chris Street had played at Iowa years before that. He had set the record at 34, got killed in a car accident before he had a chance to play another game. Both Iowa natives and Jordan Bohannon said he deserves to have his name on that record. Who knows what it would have been? Right. He could have kept going. So I am proud to have my name alongside Chris Street. We're the co-holders of that record at 34. And he said that God honored his plan and his prayer so that he could do that. And you ought to have seen the pictures of Jordan Bohannon yeah. hugging Chris Street's mom and dad after the game. It was very tough. Yeah, that was really cool. And you think about it, how God got him to the point where he made 34 yeah. in a row. He a, might have a lot of things had to go haywire. Yeah, he yeah, might have brick number 30 yeah. or whatever. That, that's a really cool yeah. thing, too. Yeah. Well, Mark and I have been talking a lot about proper respect for the national anthem. And our producer, Ben Reif, found this photograph of Xavier University. And we thought this is one of the coolest things we've seen in a long time. This is playing at uh, DePaul, if I remember correctly. You can see the, the cool picture there, the flags in the background. You can see all the Xavier players. And that's how we appreciate teams and what we uh, ask them to do whenever it comes to National Anthem time. That's a pretty cool picture there, Mark. That is a great shot. Just the, the background and the scoreboard and the, the flags represented on the video boards alone aside. And then, of course, you know, Ben's Musketeers. There you go. They, they do it right down they here. They do. Good and job. then one more honor we want to roll out in our bright spot. This is to a good friend of mine in officiating, Ed Oberlander. Ed Oberlander from New Knoxville, Ohio, will go into the Officials Hall of Fame on January 9th. He has been a, a baseball umpire for 46 years. He's officiated 45 years of high school basketball and 42 years of softball. And not only is he a very good official, but one of the best guys, one of the best ambassadors for sports around. And congratulations to Ed Oberlander. We really appreciate what you've done. We'll see you on June 9th when you go to the Officials Hall of Fame. Hey, never too many bright spots, and we appreciate all yep. the good things that are going on in our area. We're going to finish up with something that Mark and I have talked about all year long and probably ever since we started doing yep. games. There are certain players that you just love to watch play. They may not be the leading scorer. They may not be the captain, but they just do things right. They do what the coach asks them to do. They do the little things. They hustle. They aren't afraid to get on the floor. And so we started putting together our all-fun-to-watch team, right. and we came up with, 10 and an MVP. Yeah. Now, we didn't see everybody. Correct. These are players that we saw live and one that we've seen on tape on a lot of highlights. But the others, there's probably other deserving guys out there. We just didn't know yeah, about correct. them. Correct. These are the ones that we have seen. We're going to go through it. How about A.J. Arns from Versailles? Just love the way A.J. plays. He's always in position defensively. He scores on offense. He's a rebounder. And he always seems to play hard. We just like A.J. Arns. The next one is Brody Bowman from Temple. I put down he is a scoring machine. A coach, of course, a coach's kid. He's going to do things fundamentally, and boy, can he put it up there from inside or outside of school. And that move right there to the free throw, last one of his best. Owen Hegel from Ottawa Glendorf, the junior point guard. He just seems to do everything well. Here's his trip to the basket right here. He can shoot the three. He's a solid defender, and he is a quarterback on one of the best teams in our area. I really like Owen Hegel. Drew Johnson from Pandora Gilboa. He is the one player that we've not seen live, but boy, he's on the highlight tapes all the time. And he scores. Everybody knows about that, the player of the year up there in those two conferences. But he rebounds, he blocks shots, which means he hustles to get to the point, handles the ball. He is a really good all-around player. I asked some of our commentators, Mark, uh, you know, we haven't seen everybody. Who are we leaving out? And they all said, don't forget Drew Johnson. This guy's just seen play hard. All right, Jay Kaufman from Ottawa Glendorf. And, and that's the part right there I like about Jay. He is always going to the basket. He's physically strong. You can see that knee and how much better it's gotten. He rebounds, he defends. We really like how Jay Kaufman plays at Ottawa Glendorf. Drew Klein from Crestview. I say he's the quickest guy on the hardwood. And boy, we saw him last weekend over there in tournament. He goes from end to end as fast as anybody. He's always trying to get steals plays a great game, floor game, and is the general of that team, and can score when called upon Drew Klein. How about B.J. Miller from Lima Senior, one of those guys who is just fearless when it comes to taking the ball to the basket and can shoot the three ball from deep. He is one of the leaders of the Spartans. As we saw a moment ago, he made all conference, makes that three, but he can also take the ball to the goal like B.J. Miller. Ryan Nunn from Findlay. I wrote down he is a very difficult matchup because he can shoot the three, as a lot of the guys on the Finley team do, 
but he can also go inside. He's only 5'11", but rebounds. One of the leading rebounders on his team and just knows basketball. And a clutch shooter, give the ball to him at the end if you need a basket. From St. Henry, Tyler Schlarman and Mark United, we talked about this. He's listed as six foot tall. We have stood beside him. I'm not sure he's six foot tall, but he's physically strong. He shoots the basketball. He leads the team in scoring and rebounding. And we have noticed that when Tyler plays, when they need baskets, they go to him. And when they don't, they're willing to let other guys share the basketball. We really appreciate Tyler Schlarman. And you know what? No disrespect to Justin Arns. Certainly yeah. deserving of player oh, of the boy. year. But this kid is also a player of the year in that conference. Boy, he was good. Tyler Siegel from Fort Lormie, the big guy in the middle. I call him the difference maker because when he plays, they're really good. When he doesn't play, they're, they have some struggles because they miss the big guy in the middle. Won the game earlier in the season against Versailles with two back-to-back -back blocks. He just hustles, he plays hard, and that usually isn't the case for a big guy, but Tyler Siegel is a good one. And he has a mullet. <laughs> He's got the leader of the mullets. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> All right, hey, we're gonna finish up with this because when we started making this list, there was one name that popped up to both of us immediately. So the MVP of our list is Tyler Mesher from Marion Local. He is so physically strong down inside, he can dominate even though he's only 6'2". He knocks guys down, he gets knocked down, he keeps getting up, keep playing, and he's always seems to have that smile on his face, and he helps the opponents up when he knocks them over or when they knock him over, and we just like how he plays the game. There's his physical presence right there, so we're gonna be Tyler Mesher, our MVP of our most fun to watch team. And when you hear officials say that he is a joy to officiate, That's correct. that says something. That means he loves the game and he's a good teammate and he's good to his opponents, constantly helping people up. He, he's the guy that got this fun to watch team started. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right, let's put up the broadcast schedule. Ben Reif tells me we have 18 games in six days including how many at 10 o'clock? 10? No, there's five at 10 o'clock. 10, 10? 10 at 10, oh, whatever it is. I don't whatever know. it is. There you can see lots of tournament games, many of them. Mark will be doing this week. We hook up together again this weekend to get you a couple of district finals. Uh, got state wrestling down at the bottom. Boy, we're all over all different divisions. We have a lot of good tournament basketball coming your way. Who can make it to the state out of the girls? Who can make it to the regionals out of the boys? We'll determine that at the end of the week. Well, this is our last show for this season, but we want to thank Ben Reif, Nick Fraley, Garrett Mansfield. This year, we only ran through three of them. Last year was many more than that, but yeah. uh, we had a lot of fun doing the show. Yeah, we hope we you enjoyed it too, and buddy, I had a great time yes, with Yes, we you. did. All right. Hey, we'll see you next year on A Closer Look.